Thank you, John. Hello, nice to meet you all. So, uh, yeah, so as John said today, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction to the file API. So the file API is uh, it's a W3C specification that's been around for a few years now, although it's still kind of a working draft. Um, but uh, implementation is a kind of mostly widely available now in um, recent browser versions. And basically, it allows you to get access to the user's uh, local files. Uh, but importantly, it uh, integrates with the input element from HTML uh, and uses that as the mechanism for the user to select which files are allowed to be read. Because obviously, we wouldn't want web pages to be able to read arbitrary files on our computers without our choosing them. So the basics of the API are uh, this. So every input element in the DOM has a dot .files property. And that files property is a list of the files. So each, each entry is a file object, which represents the files that the user has selected in the input element. And when the user does select some file in the input element, a change event gets dispatched to that input element. And that's your cue to do something useful with those files. So here's a little demo. Um, so we have an input element there at the top with an on change uh, event listener attribute. And that just calls our function show file preview. And inside there, you can see that we're just grabbing the first file from the list of files that we select. And we're going to get the name and the size of that file and just display them on the web page there. So let's give that a shot. Oh, there we go. So we see in the, the pre-element just below the input there, it's showing us the file name and the file size. So pretty easy so far. So as well as the name and the size, you've also got access to the, the last modified time of the file. And that's exposed as a JavaScript date object. And also the type of the file. So the browser will make some guess based on the file name extension and turn that into a, a MIME type string for you to, to have a look at. Now what about actually reading the contents of the file? So to do that, we need to create a file reader object. And file readers will read the contents of a file, but they'll do it asynchronously. Now you might think, well, maybe for a small file, what, what does it matter to make it asynchronous? Uh, but often people find that doing synchronous I.O., like in the main thread of an application, whether it's a, a web application or, or a native application, can really sort of reduce the responsiveness of your application because you, you might have to wait some time for the disk to spin up. Well, maybe that's not so much of an issue these days with SSDs, but uh, you, you can get some uh, jankiness. So we create a file reader object, and we use a load event listener on it to know when it's done reading the file. And then finally, we call a method on the file reader to say, OK, go ahead and read the contents of this particular file. So this is how we would do it. Uh, so now we have a show file contents function. So first, we create the new file reader object. We assign a load listener to it uh, that will do something with the file once it's been read. And here, the method that we're calling to read the contents of the file is called read as text. So that's going to interpret the contents of the file as a plain text file. Uh, so you can see here, the, uh, there's the first argument is the actual file object um, to, that we're going to be reading from. And the second argument there is the encoding that we want to interpret it as. Inside the onload event listener there, we're grabbing the result of that, the result of reading the file, which is in this result property on the reader. So that's just going to be like the whole contents of the file in a string. So we can just assign that into some element to show it on the screen. So let's see if that works. My to-do list again. Yep, there we go. OK, so it's just displayed the contents of the file right in there. Um, so that encoding parameter that passed into read as text there, that's actually optional. You don't have to supply it. Uh, if your file is going to be in a Unicode encoding like UTF-8 or UTF-16, then it's going to use some heuristics to determine what it is. So I mean, probably you're all storing things in UTF-8 anyway, and so you don't need to specify that. So that's why those non-ASCII characters there display OK. A second way that we can read the contents of the file is to have them provided as a data URL. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with data URLs, they're basically a big hack to embed the whole contents of a file inside a URL. Uh, and, and that can be useful in situations where we want to use the contents of the file, but in a situation where we can only provide a URL for a file. So for example, in an image source or a CSS property like background image where you put URL and you have to have a URL in there. Uh, you can use a data URL to embed the whole contents of the file directly in there. 
So we can get the file reader to provide the contents of the file to us in the form of a data URL. So this is what we're doing here. So now we have an image element. This is probably like the canonical example of how to use read as data URL in the, the file API. So it's just going to provide a, a preview of the, uh, the image file. So I'll read the image file and stick it in the image element there. So we're calling read as data URL at the bottom. And now reader.result, instead of being the string contents of the file, is going to be this data URL which represents the image data. All right, let's choose our Eiffel Tower. And there we go. Oh, well, it's um, leaning, leaning Eiffel Tower anyway. Um, so I've shown just there uh, the data URL that's corresponded to that, just, just so you can see what that kind of thing looks like. Probably the most interesting thing, though, is getting your file reader to provide you access to the file as an array of bytes. So there's a third method on file reader called read as array buffer, and that will, that will give you uh, an, an array buffer representing the binary data in the file. And then we can wrap that with a, a typed array object. In this case, we'll use uint8 array, which is an unsigned integer, eight bits long, so a byte array. Uh, and then we can access the individual bytes from the file. So I've got an example of that here. We're calling read as array buffer at the end. Uh, and you can see here at the top of our onload listener, we're taking reader.result, which is now an array buffer object, wrapping it in a uint8 array, and then we'll call that bytes. And then we can just use bytes uh, like we would with any array-like object. So it's got a dot length, and it's got like normal array indexing there to grab out the bytes from the file. There we go. We can see the start of the, our JPEG there. So, so maybe that's not the most interesting use of uh, the binary access to the file that you've just loaded from the file system. Well, it might be interesting if you're writing a hex editor. Um, let's try and do something a little bit more useful. So I found on GitHub the other day um, a JavaScript library which reads the EXIF tags from a JPEG. So they are the little metadata inside uh, JPEG files that your cameras take, which like camera model information or the GPS coordinates where you took the, the photo. And one of them is the orientation. So probably you'd be familiar with tools that automatically rotate your photos when you've taken them up like that, like I had done of my uh, Eiffel Tower. So I just grabbed that library and passed into it with a, a slight amount of hacking in the library, um, our array buffer that we get from the file. And so we can grab out the orientation information from the file and use that to make sure our image gets shown up the right way. Hooray, Eiffel Tower is saved. So, so what I do is, uh, once I get the orientation information there, I just set a transform property on the element there just to rotate it to fix it up. So you might have noticed uh, when I clicked uh, the, the image file in the open dialog that popped up, there was a, maybe a very slight delay before it actually showed the image in there. And that's because data URLs can be a bit inefficient for doing this sort of thing, especially with a photo like this, which is like four megabytes long. Um, what the browser has to do is it'll read in the contents of the file, generate a data URL from it, which is going to be now like an extra third bigger, so only like five megabytes long string, then we assign that into the image source, and then the browser has to decode that data URL back to the original image contents again. So it's a bit of a sort of indirect way of doing it. A way around that is to use a blob URL instead. So blob URLs are more like pointers uh, to existing data that's inside a file object. So rather than generating a whole copy of the image data inside a data URL, we can generate a short blob URL, which just has some unique ID number inside it. Um, to point to the file object that we've already loaded to avoid having to do all this copying. So you can see down there that code snippet at the bottom, that's how you would do that. So we call url.createObjectURL, pass it in the file object, and that's the kind of string that it returns. It's in, in Firefox, there's, these are sort of UUID strings, so it's like 40, 40 bytes long or whatever it is. And then we can just assign it directly onto the image source. And then if, if we're finished with the, uh, using that image data before the page is closed, we might want to call this revoke object URL just to sort of cancel the link uh, to that image data so that it can be garbage collected so it's not going to hang around forever just in case you happen to use that URL again. So there are some other neat things that you can do with uh, file objects. You can pass them directly to an XHR send method to uh, post them to the server. Uh, you can actually get file objects out of drag and drop events into the browser. So instead of using the input element, 
then you can support dragging files from the desktop or from your uh, file explorer uh, directly onto the page or particular elements from the page. And then looking at the, uh, the event object that gets dropped there, you can grab out a file object and read that directly. So that's an alternative uh, sort of interaction method for getting access to the file. But both of them, importantly, um, can't just sort of automatically go and access the files. You ha the user has to do sort of do something to um, say that it's all right to access that file. And of course, if, if you're using an input element, then you don't have to stick with the default styling of a little browse button and a text string saying the, the file name. You can hide that input element away, present your own UI for it, and sort of invoke the open dialog by calling the click method on that uh, instead. So there are a few limitations with the API. One is that you can't uh, traverse a whole directory tree. Uh, so if, if you want to create uh, the kind of thing like uh, Facebook's image uploading plugin where you can select, like, and traverse the whole um, file system and select which photos you want to upload. You can't quite do that. And one thing I hear at Mozilla is that, well, Chrome has this file system API, so how about you guys support that as well, so we can do that kind of thing. But it's kind of a common misconception that the file system API lets you do that. Rather, it provides sort of a file system access to some sandboxed area that the browser has access to, rather than sort of general file system access. And for those kinds of things, you could just use um, IndexedDB anyway. Um, but that doesn't mean that the use case of being able to traverse over directory trees uh, isn't a good one. So I think we still need a solution there. And secondly, you can't save a file back with a particular file name. Uh, the download attribute on the A element in HTML5, that would probably work. Uh, but it hasn't got widespread implementation adoption yet. I think maybe Firefox and Chrome support it, but perhaps not the other browsers. Um, but it's still a little bit indirect as well. It'd be nice to be able to just call a single method to say, well, save this, um, save this array of bytes out to a file with a particular name. So work progresses in standards groups to uh, solve these problems. In terms of the file API itself and support for it, uh, so the spec's been around for some number of years now. So Firefox and Chrome uh, has supported it for a, a good number of years. Uh, Internet Explorer and Safari are probably the two ones to watch out for because it's only been like fully available in their most recent versions of the browsers. So probably you still want to use a polyfill at this point to uh, paper over those gaps. Uh, but such things are available, so, um, so you can do it. Okay, thank you.